uh, we've got a whole range of people talking tonight uh, and two speakers uh, who will be helping us dive into the subject of, of testing apprentices. I think uh, I will now ask the, the panel and the presenters if you can turn off your webcam. And I'll just start with a few introductory pieces before we get into the main content of the presentation. So um, first of all, just to note a couple of events coming up. We have another event coming up on Thursday, which is all about ISTQB and cracking software testing interviews. So really looking forward to that one on Thursday. We've also got a, a peer workshop on Sunday, the 22nd of November, which will, um, so this is with the Association for Software Testing, I guess our international equivalent. So we're doing a workshop on the public perception of testing. But that's gonna be, uh, it's going to run for a number of hours and we're looking to produce some um, public output about how the software testing profession is, is perceived in the, the public world. We have one space left on that workshop. There's no charge to attend. Um, but if you are interested in participating, it does require some pre-work and collaboratively, collaboratively producing some content. But if you're interested in attending, let me know. Um, you can reach me by emailing BCS and I'll put my email address um, on the chat while we're going through one of the earlier presentations. The other thing I want to mention, and I'll repeat this at the end as well, um, we are launching an award for UK-based software testing apprentices, uh, either people who are in flight on an apprenticeship or have completed it within the last six months. Uh, there's no age limitation, no experience limitation, and apprentices don't need to be BCS members to win. So there'll be a cash prize and the apprentice will obviously get to put the award on, on their CV. So if you're an employer of present, uh, apprentices, this is a really good way to promote your team. And if you're a training provider, it's also a really good way to promote the, the training track. Um, so if you are interested in nominating somebody, what we're looking for is people who've maximized the apprenticeship. So they've maximized the training, the on the job opportunities, and shown demonstrable results. So they might have made a contribution to the business activities of their employer or an open source or a not-for-profit project and are on track for a successful career in software testing. Um, you can't nominate yourself, but anybody else can nominate someone, an employer, a manager, a colleague, even a family member. And to do so, you will need to write three to 500 words about why the apprentice deserves the award and email it to sigistapprenticeaward at bcs.org.uk. This information will be posted on the BCS Sigist website in the coming days for, for reference. And I will repeat this at the end in case anyone has, has missed the email address. So, I think we can start with the first presentation. So I'm pleased to introduce uh, Vahid Garousi. So Vahid is a colleague from academia and the software industry, an associate, uh, associate professor of software engineering at Queen's University in Belfast, and is an expert in testing related education matters. So Vahid, welcome. Yes, thank you very much. Uh... Thanks a lot, Adam, for the introduction. Yes, essentially, I can now share the screen there. Is my Excellent. screen visible there on your side? Yes, can see a cluttered desktop. Cluttered desktop, okay. Uh, yeah, let me get used to this uh, yet another technology. Um, just, uh, well, I tried to share Okay, let me see, because it didn't ask me what to share. I was going to share screen number two. Let me again, try it again, because sharing. <laughs> hmm. Let me see if I can. Uh, so how could I say to the software to share only my screen number two? Because all these softwares have such um, features, but I cannot find. Because I just no, have you have to move the present. Number. Yeah. Hmm, yeah, that's a okay screen. Okay, number two. Yes, now I found a way to do it. Yeah. Okay. Is that now visible? Uh, can you see the PowerPoint? Yes, that's that's visible. Thank you. 
Okay, yes, yes, yes. It had this, you know, all of these online conference tools have their own way of sharing. <laughs> you know, I'm sure you also have been using, I'm using five or ten of these software tools, so it's good. Okay, so yes, um, essentially, you know, I was asked by um, Adam to uh, talk about you know, uh, software testing, education, and training. And I have been working in both, well, industry and academia and for myself. So I'm kind of have already, I think, uh, uh, quite, uh, I would say, uh, so, so my profile in a way, you know, spans between academia and industry. So now uh, I will mention to you about that. I'll just make it full size. Are there, oh, sorry, just one second. No, there were, okay. We can now see just my own webcam. I guess everybody has yet turned off the cam. So, but just gonna, you know, speaking to myself there. So, so I work at Queen's University. I also I have my own consulting firm that I provide coaching, training, and also uh, health in test automation. So uh, really, uh, test automation has been my area since the last 20 years. Okay, um, so I will kind of slightly, so I won't talk too much about myself. I will mention who am I, right? So how I have been doing software testing. So of course, training and education is part of it, but actually doing the actual technical work. So I will speak a little bit about state of testing education in university and training in industry. So education is often used for university learning and training is often used for industry learning. And how do we provide or how, how do we and how can we provide the best and most effective in education and training? Well, because at the end of the day, the, 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 um, the human resources that we need and the, we actually that, that work in, as workforce in testing and some of them go through university education, some of them don't go through university education in testing. I'll provide some resources. So by the way, I can I will be very really happy to provide the slides as well. I think I put them on the slide share website and I can send that to you later. So as you can see, I'm I'm a very international person. You know, I've just lived in uh, I've worked in five countries. And hopefully UK will be the last destination. I guess I'm getting old. So we will be staying here for uh, many many years or forever hopefully uh so bachelor's master's and phd all in software engineering and also phd in software testing so actually my phd was on model-based testing uh, of real-time systems in canada which i worked yeah, with industry to test an actual system and i've been in academia and also again i would say 20 percent of my effort is outside academia so i do a lot in consulting and a few other things um along the way so some pictures from this from a consulting session, this is a testing conference, another testing conference, and a classroom picture. So really, I was just counting the other day, you know, how much education I've provided. So actually, I think I should go with the slides first. So how I came to testing myself, yeah, this slide should be first, second, really. Um, you know, I started working as a developer in 1997. And uh, also, well, immediately became more passionate in testing. Of course, I love development. And I like testing more, essentially. So I've been doing it uh, testing since year 99 uh, to be kind of, well, at first, uh, of course, we we're doing manual testing and developing, uh, uh, writing manual test scripts. Then I immediately found more passion to be more passionate about automated testing. So since year 99, the first tool I was using, I think it's always look, I could look at the history, you know, um, uh, you know, I use we, we use in our team uh, IBM Rational Functional Tester, which is a record and playback tool. Again, uh, I'm sure you have used many tools such as this or this particular tool as this. So this is kind of a picture of me in the company that I was working in. Um, so it's so very cool, right? Remember, you know, for 21 years, we yeah, are writing, developing uh, autom automated tests. So I was counting the other day how many, and then since I was the year 2005. I have been providing training in university and also in industrial settings. So I've been providing corporate training to various customers on basics of testing and also special topics such as model-based testing, uh, Selenium, you know, web application, mobile testing. Uh, for example, this is just three three months ago. Uh, this is an, an ongoing engagement I have with a company in Turkey, uh, model-based testing. So I help them to develop large test suites. Um, model-based test suites and run them uh, fully automated and of course part of that is testing and training because a uh, few people well I help them to write to write and design the test models uh, but after, of course they have to learn themselves to, to be to do it better and of course continue carrying it on so 
the state of education and training, right? So, I mean, software testing, um, uh, I think, well, we can look at the estimates of testers worldwide. I think, well, ISTQB is one of those popular certificates, and there are many ways. I mean, that could provide one metric, for example. For example, I think like the last time I checked the ISTQB, like more than 600 to 700,000 certificates were issued, I think. And there are estimates of software developers to be around 26 million people worldwide, software developers. So that's a lot of people, and I would say, perhaps the worldwide software testers could be, you know, I don't know, I cannot say exactly, but perhaps uh, at least a few million, like, right? So I, I, could, I could, we could say that, you know, at least uh, two or three million or something like that, full-time software testers. So of course, most of these people, uh, again, I mean, we can, yeah, see how, let's see how people that work as testers, but you kind of need some good level of amount of knowledge and skill set to do that job with high quality, right? So I think that kind of goes without saying that Education and training of software engineers and testers are very important. And again, university is one side of the things, one side of the angle uh, of the picture, but of course, training in industry and uh, yeah, education of people who work in the industry. And I was just checking today for, uh, I put software testing training in Google Box, and I got about 1 billion hits, right? 930 million hits. Of Google page, of pages that Google has provided index to on software testing training. So this is a huge uh, market and huge demand for testing and need. I think there's a need, there's demand, there's a market for it. Again, uh, I'm passionate about those two for so education, university, and training in industry really. So I think it's just um, when education and, and um, university and industry come come closer together, we can do this job much better. So this is a um, I kind of a diagram, I hope it doesn't come across as too complex. So how, oh, like the, well, some people call it context diagram. So it shows a diagram of how people go through, you know, learning and uh, learning about testing and working in, in the industry. Again, some of people who work as testers go through university system. Some go without university education, I think apprenticeship or some other things are, um, could be that route, but through university education, we have people who take software engineering, CS or IT, various degrees, or people from others, CS and IT degrees and go and become testers, which is completely normal. I've had many people with uh, degrees from physics, from mathematics, who become software, very good software testers, especially in domain expertise, because sometimes they need to test a software that does physics, so that person perhaps can make sense of the software better than me because he has or she has the, the physics, right? The domain expertise. Um, so, and of course, university systems and programs in different universities in UK and also across the world have varying level or we, we teach varying level of testing knowledge, fortunately or unfortunately. So again, it's, I'm sure you can uh, have seen university degrees and modules and courses. Some teach a bit, a single module and testing something. Some universities don't teach anything. And the student graduates from computer science and goes to industry and says, well, I heard about testing, but I haven't done any automated testing, or I don't know much about black box testing, for example. So that could be a challenge because you have a person with a CS degree from a good university, but testing knowledge is very low. So just to be very honest, because these are the feedbacks that I've been receiving from companies for many, many years. It's still low. So, so this is kind of a, a nice person that has graduated from university or comes for without university education, which is fine. He or she wants to work in testing industry. And he may do, you know, we can call him software professional, software engineering, software testing professional. Sometimes this person may get motivated to do self-learning and software testing. And self-learning, you know, we can do it through online materials. There are lots of lots of good materials. And of course, there are lots of, lots of let's say, not so good material online. Uh, of course, uh, and then YouTube videos, you know, there are so many, so many resources, online blogs and websites. And so that will, of course, uh, uh, motivation is to do a better job in his or her work and also even to change jobs, right? So if somebody wants to do a more higher level testing job, you know, test manager, et cetera, or test specialist. There are many good certificates. I think the main one is ISTQB that, you know, the UK and other countries that have their own local chapters that do these certificates. And I also have been, been involved and also providing training to them for a few years. Um, anyways, um, so these are also called self-taught. 
So I put the Lopers testers, etc. So that's I think that's a big picture that I wanted to provide. And of course, in our field, everybody has to constantly learn new, new things to keep up. So this is both good and bad. Um, I mean, so many new, but of course, the fundamentals don't change too much. Like if, you, if we talk about test case, test suite, I mean, the concept doesn't change. I mean, it hasn't changed. I had a, I had purchased my first book of testing, which was published in 1977. I forgot the author's name. So that, that book is a bit older than myself. So, so some fundamentals haven't changed, but some new trends coming. So, of course, all these things need learning. Um, so. There are many important to add, questions to ask and to answer when we talk about education and training of testers. What testing topics shall we train our trainees? How should we train? The training style, right? I mean, so there are so many interesting, I mean, all these things could be elaborated a lot. For trainees with different backgrounds, come with a university in the software engineering or CS or anything else, or those without. How should we answer the both questions? And how should the other very important question, how much focus that I've been discussing with my colleagues in various companies, how much focus on testing concepts versus testing tools? Because some people are more passionate about tools than concepts, but it turns out that if we focus too much on tools, we forget the fundamentals and only knowing how to use the tool doesn't help much if you change the project. So the person, the tester needs good, and I'm gonna talk about this a bit more. So, means some good amount of uh, of concepts, learning them, and then using tools to actually apply those things. So, how do we? I hope we are we are okay in terms of time, Adam. I hope. Yes, I think carry on. I think we're good. How do we provide the most effective education training? So again, it's there are many ways to train. Uh, personnel and staff and testers. But of course, there's no one single way. Of course, I should say that there's no one way. I mean, we can, have, we can provide training in uh, in hundred different ways, and they could be all good depending on the context. Um, so, so I think providing the right training for each entry, uh, training, sorry, based on his or her background, really. I mean, again, it goes back to my previous conversation. Like, it's because I have been providing really the training to all three. Um, uh, well, I don't think it goes beyond this three, right? For example, in my in the courses that I teach in university in testing, I'm teaching testing in 2005. So, uh, yeah, I think there, there could be slight differences because the background and the context could be different. And, uh, and in, in providing the very focused and very hands-on training to industry, uh, to people who already work in the companies that could be different than university students. And also apprenticeship because they also work in the company, they have started it, but they need to learn to actually very well first to actually do, provide some output and do some activities. So I've had some, again, I won't go too much to detail, but this, uh, these topics have been actually topics of conversation and papers and articles. For example, choosing, I had a paper, that was in 2010 or 12, Choosing the right test, right test tools and system under test, right? So, what type of uh, really applied work, applied concepts? There was a very interesting workshop called Workshop on Teaching Software Testing in Florida in 2012. I was there, um, so that was interesting to present that and discuss it with others. Um, I think to learn, and I think not just me, I, I am many, many others in the industry who think that. Learn and conduct for paper testing in need, training needs a right mix of fundamental uh, fundamentals of testing, such as you know what is black box techniques of black box testing, and then choose how to choose the right tools and how to apply and use those tools properly. There are many discussions. I'm sure you have come across them um, uh, in online sources. Only test automation tool is not enough to guarantee success whatsoever. And I've seen. I'm sure you may have seen. Many teams, unfortunately, just think they just apply a tool and they would think it's going to work perfectly, but it doesn't turn out that way. This is from a book, uh, again, on testing, says the selection and usage of a test tool does not guarantee success. Yeah, so we need proper test strategy and skill sets. Right? So it's just about the skill set that that person has. It's all about skill. Uh, one other way I've been doing that, um, I have had an ongoing activity. Uh, on designing and offering a set of free 
hands-on exercise set. So it's really a number of learning resources that I use both in my there's different right <laughs> that both in my university education activities and also my corporate training activities. So essentially, whenever a company comes to me, I say, well, we want any learning uh, corporate training. So and then we just choose a, a mix of these things, and I have a few more. And such as model-based testing, I haven't added that to this list. Uh, which right now, I'm very active in model-based testing, um, which is actually black box testing. I think so. So we, I provide that training, and I just well customize it to actually to their systems. Often, I will show you some. So these are uh, well six of those topics. So, and I'll show you one example, the number one, which I that's that's kind of how I start to teach um, a new beginner what is testing. Right? So I start with manual testing, and then I gradually go to automation. Of course. I keep emphasizing that there is a value for both. So I'm not uh, um, uh, well, a very uh, one-sided supporter of one on the other approach. Kind of anything has its own meaning and its end, uh, whatever it works. Um, so again, this is the URL. I just want to mention it. It's, it's fully free. And um, well, the whole, my whole goal has been to provide it, uh, was developed by me and also maintained by me and a few other colleagues over the years. Uh, to provide really uh, a free resource to learn testing in a very applied and hands-on way. It's not not that, that much theoretical or you know, theory. It's just you know taking an actual. We provide the large systems on the test, like 50,000 line of code, and we provide the instructions on how to do it and just install the, the tool, the test tool, and step by step. And I will show you just a little screenshot of that. It has, I'm very happy to say that it has been used by about 55 instructors of 17 countries so far, and there have been many many positive feedback. For example, um, um, lab number one, which is just usually the starting of, uh, of a training on this topic, is introduction to testing and defect tracking, bug tracking. Students learn how to do ad hoc, manual, and regression testing using, uh, well, usually we have a really collection of bug tracking tools that I'm sure you are familiar with. There are Bugzilla, there's Jira, there's, there are so many, many. So we usually, depending on the need of the company, we choose one of them. Um, and then we, well, they apply the actual lab exercise on that. So, for example, well, they do ad hoc testing, which is kind of random testing, and then make it, when we want the students to really learn that, of course, ad hoc testing is okay sometimes, but it's not always very really effective. Uh, system on the test is actually an ATM simulation software. So, on your mobile, not mobile phone, on your desktop, just like an ATM system will run up, and it's a simulation, of course, doesn't connect with the real bank, but it will actually do most of the functions. And we have, of course, injected realistic defects in the system. The actual system was uh, high quality. So, so the students need to find those uh, unknown number of defects. Well, we know how many, but they, they don't know. Um, the lab exercises are very uh, well detailed. Like this, uh, the, the lab document is about 23 pages. It just goes through everything, objectives, pre-lab, instruction, do this, do that. And yeah, it provides everything that a person needs really to do it. And they have been used again in my university and industrial training. So they have been really tuned for many years. We have tried to update it and make it better and more fluent. Some more resources like this. I'm coming to our end. So it's not, uh, of course, uh, there are many, many more activities uh, by university people and also industrial trainers. Of course, many people also work as full time trainers. and. Usually in summers, when I have more time, I provide more training in industry, three months, four months, full time. Uh, so many people are also share their experience and best practices to how to do this education and training in our area better. Of course, uh, you know, mostly academics tend to write more uh, because they're more passionate for long papers or articles, but there are also people from industry also write um, to share their experience, right? How, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting topic, right? sharing experience and how we educate testers. So we actually, so myself and a few of uh, my colleagues, we got motivated to do a survey paper. So survey paper means we looked at and we found all the papers that report experience on how we can teach testing in a good way and how we want to teach not in a bad way. So we found 204 papers from 92. So that's a lot of papers. And I provide the PDF link of that paper that you can also, this is the first one. So these four uh, screenshots are four of those 204 papers. So for example, it says how to train up a new software tester. It's a blog post. 
an agile classroom experience teaching TDD and refactoring. It's a paper from, um, yeah, from the US published in this conference. As you can see, many US American people are very active in this, but of course, from other places. This is a paper from Netherlands. I know actually the people there. Pragmatic testing education, how we can do this in a very pragmatic way, you know, which I also like very much. I'm a pragmatic, you know, I tend to be a pragmatic person. Bug hunt, making early software testing lessons engaging and affordable. So very, very interesting topics and lots of insights about people who you know, have been teaching these things for many years and uh, just sharing their experience out. Remember how to teach so that you know our trainings grasp it better, so that you know everybody wins. So that's kind of my final slide, and I am done at this point. Just um, yeah, just a summary of what we talked a little very briefly. If you have any questions, just yeah, I'm here to hear. Thank you very much, Vahid. We'll we'll take some audience questions after Alison's presentation, which which is next. I just have one key question for you though. You've talked about the different tools that help people learn about testing. How, you're in a kind of unique position, having seen three different categories of learner, you know, learn about testing. And have you seen any differences in either their ability to learn about testing or their motivation and engagement? Well, of course, nice question you asked, but it has several aspects. So the motivations, and I think uh, I'm just trying to remember the highlight, the keywords you mentioned. Motivations and how they learned testing? Yeah, I guess how effectively they learned about testing and how engaged they were in the, the learning. Indeed. Have you seen any differences between people who are pursuing an academic track, people who are already in industry and upskilling, and people who are entry level in, in apprenticeships roles? Yeah, I mean, uh, people in industry, of course, uh, because, well, students that we are, we have a university, right? Because well, most of them, they're going to well, hopefully graduate and go to industry. So they, most of the students understandably have not worked in industry. By the way, we have some slight difference there. Some of our students, as you know, they, they take placement, one year placement, and they come back and do their last year. So actually my course often occurs in the final year, in a year that the students are back from industry. So they clearly know what is going on in industry. Because of that, um, but of course they're junior, right? They are just uh, taking the first steps in the software world. Uh, so depending on seniority so students that have seen industry for one year well they often so i'm very passionate to say that yeah their motivation for testing is enormous because uh, for example last year that i was teaching uh, students were so eager they said you know well 10 students also came to me and said well they said well i was doing test automation in my internship can you not help me to move more because i want to continue test automation that was what he was telling me so i think Really, we are in well, as they, I don't want to over exaggerate, but I think we are in golden times for testing. I think many people, uh, well, at least in Belfast, as you know, we have a very active software industry here. Even I heard after London, it is the most active in Europe. I don't know by, by, by which metric, but I heard something like that in a website. So, students, well, they, many of them, uh, they appreciate that testing is important. And well, now I come back, I'll try to make my answer short for you. When we, I provide training to comp, uh, yeah, to testers who work in company, they want to just make their like knowledge better. Their uh, their interest and motivation also is high, but of course very focused, right? The person says, right? I mean, for example, like they ask me to help them with learning of model based testing. Of course, I just have to focus on that. I mean, I I summarize everything else. I, I understand their needs, what they know, so that I can tell them, I can teach them more, so that they they learn more. So uh, I try to answer you. I think. And of course, I'm not a, uh, so in a very unbiased way, I would just want to say that, yeah, well, both students and also well, junior people in industry are very passionate to learn more. So that's my short answer. Thank you very much. I, I can understand that because I think when you're learning about it theoretically without much um, experience of it in industry, you might be more attracted to pure coding or a software development track, whereas once people have seen that there is a lot more than development in terms of industry problems yeah. to solve, they're more interested. Yeah. And if I can have one or two minutes, um, and the other reality is that, I will try to mention this in a very objective and a very, let's say, yeah, um, low key way. Uh, it depends on how you teach testing. That is a, like, what you teach and how to teach is very important, of course. I mean, if you, 
if the instructor of a university course or industrial session just mentions the concepts, you know, what is Tesco? If the whole, you know, two, three hours are spent on, on definitions without no real example, then I mean, everything will stay fuzzy. I mean, that's, which I don't like at all. I mean, I, in my style, you know, I start with test case, test suite, and I immediately give a real example, like a real, real example, like if you want to test, for example, a real application. So the style and mode of teaching, of testing especially, has to be hands-on. So usually I say like 50-50, 50% concepts, 50%. So the conceptual stuff have to support the, the, the hands-on stuff. So that's my philosophy, really. Because if you teach a theory and doesn't show it in practice, Again, it's a dangerous statement, but I don't say there is no value. There is little value because our field is very practical, right? And because we are in a very practical and applied field in software engineering. Great. Thank you very much, Vahid. Um, I guess now we will move to Alison. So welcome, Alison. I know you don't have a, a webcam. Um, so Alison's worked for the BCS as a quality delivery manager for the last few years. And I believe it's quality checked over 7,000 apprentice assessments. That's yeah, a lot. We're actually up to 8,000. We're actually up to 8,000 now, <laughs> but um, you know, it is what it is. Can everyone see my screen, or is it not shared yet? It's not shared yet. I might have to do something. I think I think I need permission to do that in the nicest possible way. Um, one minute. No problem. I'll get there. Fab. Okay, I think. As if by magic, can you see that? Yes. Fantastic. We okay, we're up. Um, well, sort of moving on very, very nicely from Vahid's um, presentation about sort of the practical application. Obviously, I'm going to talk to you about the apprenticeships that are underway, give you an overview of what we do what my role is and how the apprenticeship program works. Um, I'm not sure if you are familiar with apprenticeships, but we are actively trying to encourage people um, to do more apprenticeships, um, especially in the software testing and development area, but I'll move on to that with you. Um, so as um, Adam said, my name is Alison Pierce. I'm the quality delivery manager for apprenticeships and I put my email address on there because I'm more than happy for anybody to contact me if they're thinking about apprenticeships, if they're working in apprenticeships or if they just want some further information. Okay. Right, so my role at BCS is one that's kind of generated itself as um, apprenticeships have progressed. Um, my role is primarily to um, monitor the quality of all the endpoint assessments and as Adam just pointed out we've done, um, I've personally overseen about 8,000 um, and to encourage good practice. What I do as well as um, looking at the outcomes of the assessments, I also identify any key trends or issues with those assessments to encourage good practice across the sector to improve the level that we're seeing coming through for assessment and that's across all of the digital standards. I work with a number of trained providers um, and we work with different and new ones every week just to make sure that they understand the requirements and expectations for endpoint assessment and um, they're able, the apprentices are able to have the best experience and to achieve. Um, I also spend some time supporting apprentices, we conduct webinars, um, we provide support materials to make sure that they know what the expectations are um, of the apprenticeship programme. As I said, I quality control the assessments and I also manage a team of nearly 100 assessors, all of whom work in their appropriate sectors um, to make sure that they are correctly assessing the apprenticeship programmes. Um, and then we also run um, a minimum of four standardisation events every year to make sure that they are all following the same guidelines. OK, so that's my role. Um, what I want to do is just sort of recap on the apprenticeships, where they were and where they are now and why the changes. So pre-2015, um, apprentices would carry out, um, complete a knowledge qualification. It could be a BTEC or anything similar. It would be coursework. They would have it marked in college. Um, and fundamentally, it would keep be being sent back to them until they got the um, coursework right. The competence qualification, which was designed to um, be hands-on in the workplace, actually didn't re require a workplace. It could all be done again in a college environment, and the assessor would make sure that they evidenced to tick the boxes to say that 
you know, the apprentice had done it two or three times. Um, there was also a requirement for functional skills or um, GCSEs in maths and English and ICT. And then there were some other exercises where the apprentice would fill in um, documents saying what soft skills they thought they had and what personal th thinking and learning skills they also had. And those apprenticeships were at level two, three and four. Level two, um, for those of you not familiar with education, level two is GCSE level, level three is a level equivalence and level four is classed as foundation degree. Okay. It wasn't an ideal situation because an apprentice could never fail an apprenticeship program. Okay. So why the change? Um, government focus identified, especially in the digital sector, that there were a number of emerging gaps and the gaps were not being filled by people leaving school or college or university necessarily. Um, so a number of groups were put together, driven by the employers as a, as a wider working group to look at how apprenticeships could be improved and what the expectations for those would be. Um, it established the fact that there needed to be portfolio evidence, but there also needed to be wider employer engagement and sector engagement to identify what was actually needed, and what skills would need to be demonstrated as part of the apprenticeship programme. They also introduced the concept of grading, so an apprentice can now fail an apprenticeship programme. They can also pass the apprenticeship programme. They can also get a merit or a distinction based on a range of different criteria, which I won't bore you with this evening. Fundamentally, the biggest key issue was the fact that the apprentices must be employed. All of the evidence that they submit for their assessment um, to evidence their competence must have been achieved within the workplace as part of their day-to-day -day role. And that was the key differentiator between the old side style of standard and the new. So what are we looking at now? At present, and obviously this is a constantly shifting landscape, however, at present, the apprentices put together a summative portfolio of evidence of their best pieces of work, which they achieved during the apprenticeship programme. Um, we are actively working with all training providers and apprentices to make sure that they give their best pieces, they give the breadth and depth of information and narrative so that the people assessing them, although they don't know them, can get a feel for who they are and how good they are um, from that portfolio. The employer engagement stretches to the inclusion of an employer reference. So every employer is required to write a reference document for the apprentice to underpin what they've done throughout the program, to say who they've worked with, how they've worked, potentially what they've done. Um, and that's included within the assessment um, remit. They are also required to complete knowledge modules. Um, and I'll come on to that momentarily, but fundamentally, each different apprenticeship program has um, different knowledge modules and they're required to complete those to evidence that they have learnt about the industry and the sector and the role itself. Again, maths, English and any special considerations are also key to making sure that the apprentice can go forward to achieving their apprenticeship, but also if they are not academic, but they are vocationally very good, they would not be penalised or miss out in any way. They go through a process that is known as gateway, so they have to be competent and knowledgeable at that point in time to go through the gateway and all parties, the training provider, the apprentice and the employer say to the best of their knowledge that they are competent in those areas. Um, they complete a project, synoptic project, which is controlled by BCS um, after they've, they've um, gone through this gateway process. And then they will progress on to their endpoint assessment interview. This is carried out with an industry specialist who has been trained as an assessor, um, who knows the standard and will have a completed professional discussion with them to just confirm competence in the areas that they've identified. And at the end of that process, the apprentice will be awarded a fail, a pass, a merit or a distinction. OK. So, as I said, it is holistic, but a lot of the evidence will come from the portfolio and the employer reference to evidence and show the assessor the competence. Um, the project will underpin that and it's a scenario that they will respond to as software testers um, and then the interview will dig 
in more depth into what they do and how they do it. And that's the wider holistic assessment. OK. So the current, and I do, I'll explain why I'm saying current software tester apprenticeship is currently at level four, that which is the foundation degree level. It covers a range of criteria, which I'll move on to, but the apprentices are assessed fundamentally on what they do, how they do it, and who they do it with. Um, and they must meet all the requirements from technical knowledge and understanding, the application of those into technical competencies, and also that they are worthwhile in the workplace, that they have the underpinning skills, attitudes and behaviours for the appropriate workplace and for also um, dealing with customers, clients and other individuals. OK. So at the moment, and this is a direct lift from today from the Institute for Apprenticeship site, at the, at the moment within the software tester um, standard or ap apprenticeship standard, there are two knowledge modules that the apprentices are required to complete. They could either do um, BCS knowledge modules or they could do the ISTQB. Um, the majority will do the ISTQB and the BCS certificate because they have to do one of each category. OK. I'm not going to read through all of these because they are on the IFAC website. However, I've just put up there, which I'll give you a chance just to scan through. Those are the competencies that the apprentice has to evidence themselves achieving within the workplace. At the end of their program of work and study, and they spend 20% of their time off the job doing their knowledge while they're doing 80% of competence within the workplace. Those are all the kinds of competences they are required to ev evidence just to achieve a pass. The apprentices are also required to evidence how they understand you know, the basic software testing. And again, just a few seconds, just to sort of scan that list. These, all of these requirements, all of these criteria must be evidenced and um, validated by the assessor for the apprentice to achieve. They are also assessed on their application of soft skills, the underpinning skills, attitudes and behaviours um, within the workplace. And some of that, a lot of that will come from the employer reference saying how well they've performed. It will come from the narrative in the summative portfolio. It will also come from the discussion that they will talk through what they've done, how they did it and who they did it with. OK, so there is a lot of onus on the apprentice to provide evidence and to you know, discuss with an industry specialist that they are competent to working, be working in the sector. OK, just a few stats here for you. Um, and these are to the end of August 2020 because we do quarterly results. Um, at the moment, you can see this first column here is software developer. It's a level four and equates at level four with a software tester. And the middle one here is the software development technician, which is a level three A level equivalence. And it's the springboard for um, apprentices to either become software developers or to move into testing both at level four. So it's their progression pathway. As you can see at the moment, which is very, very interesting, um, is that we've we've only ever had six. Sorry, this this is this year. We've had um, 600 software developers, 713 software development technicians, level three, and 100 software testers. So at the moment, and I'm hoping you guys out there are going to change this. We have a very minimal number of software testers coming through the system. Um, of which we do get a 94.1% pass, pass rate, unsurprisingly, because the attention to detail um, of the software testers is also reflected in the portfolios and the work that they submit. OK, now earlier on, I said that the current standard, and this is what it is, 
Um, the Institute for Apprenticeships has acted on feedback and is fully reviewing the full suite of digital apprenticeship programs and the software tester has always been also been included within that um, remit. So I've just put on there a link for you which I'm obviously happy to share these slides with Adam um, and the wider group but the Institute for Apprenticeships as I said are revising the software tester apprenticeship standard. What they've recommended is, and I will go through these points because I just want to clarify each one, that the standard, the, comp, the scope of it is revised and it's also leveled back to level three. So they, they're actually downgrading, downgrading the academic level from level four to level three and they're wanting to change it to digital test technician as opposed to software tester. They've also removed any industry certifications. I noticed Fahid was talking about the um, ISTQB. That has now been stripped out of the apprenticeship programme and is no longer a requirement or an inclusion. Um, the use of the professional certifications for the sector have been completely removed from all apprenticeship programmes and moving forward, they can no longer be used or achieved using public funding. Um, so the content has been changed to reflect the need for the off the job minimum 20%. Um, apprentices have to spend that time studying or improving themselves. They've asked to include modern software engineering. Again, I won't read the bullet points. Automation of testing, um, different test management tools. Um, and again, things that could be tested, including the mobile apps, um, the Internet of Things, and so on and so forth. Um, they've also the working group and it's this this standard isn't finalized which is why I put the link at the top because you can still get involved if you'd like to um, is the need for apprentices to work in multidisciplinary teams to get that exposure and develop their transferable skills and their flexibility in what they do um, they're trying to describe in more detail the sectors where um, apprentices will be working and where the occupation is typically used and also they want to focus more on the software development life cycle as opposed to just focusing solely on the testing and the testing process okay i've got to questions but i know that adam is keen to sort of do questions at a different point in time so i will hand back to adam on that one and then obviously happily answer questions as we move further forwards no we're actually going to do speaker questions now um yep. so I think we'll, I think Nicola, would you like to just process any audience questions now? Hi, yeah. Um, yeah, I can do. Um, I've got a few here. I'm not entirely sure if um, Alison can answer this one, um, but it's uh, the first one I've got here is um, which skill do I need to work on as a first year software engineering student? Um, I'm not sure if that'd be myself or Fahid because um, this is a very vocational focus as opposed to the academic. So if somebody's doing a university degree in software testing, um, I think that would probably be Fahid, who's more of a specialist in that area. I don't know if he's still on the call. I don't know if he is. I think he had to dial off, didn't he, Adam? Um, yes, um, oh, OK. Uh, I think I can, the, yeah, the question from, yeah, that was asked, right? So which skill do I need to work I think the question was slightly not clear. Um, like, could you clarify that? Because, okay, like, you, know, you want me to read it again? Um, it's which skill do I need to work <laughs> on as a first year software engineering student? And I'm guessing they probably mean in order to get into software testing or to go on to the right track to become a software tester. I think your diagram probably showed the pathways in. Yeah. in your presentation so are you um uh, you're asking this for a student who is a first year i mean a student as you said you want to know yes so the question what is you can develop on to be a good tester when you right and to be employed and to well, to excel yeah. in that career yeah i mean well by definition your yeah, software testing will well is a well uh, uh, is mainly yeah categorized as a as, as Test automation actually becomes more and more present in industry. So software tech testing really becomes a branch of software engineering. Of course, 
people from outside software engineering also come to testing. But so essentially, in the next few years, that if you're asking for yourself or for somebody else, that student really has to um, <coughs> improve well his or her software engineering skills in general, right? So uh, I think as uh, yeah, the, the, as the talk after me just mentioned, right? So the importance of software like development life cycle because testers and some companies testers or developers are slightly separate and some companies they're almost the same the same people same person develops the software and develops the test cases for his own his own software so in general my advice would be just to keep increasing your software life cycle knowledge right so software requirements because requirements are also very important for testing software design development testing and maintenance right so those are the classical cases and then I've had students who kind of wanted, yeah, as just like yourself early on, they identified that they would want to be testers later on um, as they started their software engineering or computer science degree. And uh, well, in your university, I'm not sure where you were studying, but if they did it, well, again, that's another interesting point of point uh, of conversation that I mentioned, right? So some universities for their CS and SE programs, they have a testing course, some people you know, don't have. If you, if you your own program, you don't have such a module, well, you need to um, kind of learn on your own or yeah, in the between other modules, you need to learn. Okay. I've got another question here, um, if, I'm, if I can ask that one, uh, from one of our, another uh, person on the call. Um, what happens if an employer fails to provide a project for apprenticeship? Okay, um, there's, there's a variety of different ways of interpreting the word project, so I'll just run through them with you. Um, we ask for um, projects to be allocated to an apprentice throughout their working. So it's basically something that they're working on in the workplace. It could be a component of a project. It could be if it's a long term project. It could just be certain parts of it. But each core set of um, activities that the apprentice does would class to us as, an, as a project so that they would complete all of those key activities demonstrating all their competences and each one of those would cut classes if almost like a mini project with regards to the project that the apprentice completes post gateway bcs set an issue those out to the apprentices to um, test and evidence a key set of criteria so the training providers will always liaise with the um, employer right at the start of the program to make sure that the apprentice will have exposure during their job role to be able to carry out different tasks and complete, complete those mini projects to evidence their portfolio. Okay. Um, and another question I, um, I can see here is, and it's quite particular because it's related to a, a specific uni, I think, um, but it says, do, do the BCS work with local colleges? Uh, does BCS work with local colleges on the apprentice programs, particularly in Belfast Met? Or is um, the BCS apprenticeship a separate application? Um, the the BCS, well, it, it, it's actually an IFATE apprenticeship. Um, BCS is just the Endpoint Assessment Organisation. Um, we work with a range of um, colleges, training providers um, within England and, and Northern Ireland because um, apprenticeships are only approved within those two countries. Wales has, diff has different countries, has different apprenticeship programmes as do Scotland, but we do work with a range of colleges and training providers in both Northern Ireland and England. Okay, I'm just checking if there are any more for now. I've actually got one question, um, Adam here. Alison, you said that the apprenticeship is changing. I guess one of my questions is how that impacts people who are already in flight with an apprenticeship. There and I also no wondered. Okay. Right, and I also wondered if uh, this specialist group through BCS can have can can provide a view on some of those changes. Okay, to address both of those separately. Um, <laughs> If somebody's already started on an apprenticeship program, they will not be impacted in any way, shape or form. We are expecting the new revision to be implemented by IFATE. They did it initially forecast um, the 1st of January next year. My personal opinion is the fact that we won't see those till March, April or May. 
um, any apprentice registered on those um, apprenticeship programs prior to that time will still complete the existing level four apprenticeship, however long that may take them. With regards to working with the group to improve, again, BCS don't own the standards, they are owned by the Institute for Apprenticeships, we're just approved and regulated to um, carry out the endpoint assessments. So what I would recommend people do is have a look on the Institute for Apprenticeship website, there are some contact details of the individuals who are leading the Trailblazer group, you may still be able to have some input on that. Great, thank you. Okay, and I think we can also talk about um, that in the panel session. So let's get started on that. Can all the panelists enable audio and webcam? Hey guys. Hi Great. Everyone. Hello. So I'm happy to introduce, in the order I see them on, on my screen, uh, we have Kieran Marriott, who's a software testing apprentice at Dragonfly. Uh, Clevis Voker, who's a hiring manager of apprentices also at Dragonfly. Uh, Yvette Berman, who uh, has been working at Deutsche Bank and has a lot of experience managing teams, but doesn't currently hire software testing apprentices. Uh, Marisa, also a software testing, a completed software testing apprenticeship with a distinction. Um, and a black square. I don't think I'm missing anyone. <laughs> okay, so um, I've got a few questions uh, that I prepared, but we'll also take questions from the audience about your experiences as well. So I wanted to start off with you, Clevis, and ask you what your experience has been like hiring and leading a team of, of apprentices. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the experience has been very, very pleasant. Um, the hiring process is actually very, very easy. So what we found is that uh, uh, as a hiring manager, it's actually very easy to uh, not only set up the interview process, but actually get through that interview process very, very quickly. And with the right candidates, we're able to hire them directly within Dragonfly and within our company very quickly, which is which is a real, real positive, right? Sometimes uh, that period of time uh, does uh, go on a little bit longer than usual, but uh, the hiring process has actually been very, very good from my perspective. Uh, the management process has actually been pretty spectacular as well. I mean, we at Piccadilly Group and Dragonfly, we've uh, we've hired apprentices at various different stages within their lives and within their careers. So some people have come directly from uh, A levels, whilst others have gone on to university and and started uh, thinking about apprenticeship uh, being a little bit more uh, in tune with what they want to do and. What we've actually seen is that um, regardless of the level at which apprentices are coming through to us, uh, their aptitude and their ability to actually really focus on the task at hand and, and really deliver the quality that we need and has been really, really positive. And that's something that I would say across the board. I mean, it's been a real surprise for us and it's something that we've only just escalated the amount of apprentices that we hire at Piccadilly Group because of the standards and the levels that we are seeing, which has been incredibly positive. Great. So, Marista, you completed your apprenticeship. What what was your experience like being an apprentice? Uh, positives and negatives? Um, being very honest, it's really difficult. Um, it's it's not an it's not an easy thing that um it. it I, I think it can vary in different places of work, but um, for us, um, we were kind of a trial run of doing apprentices. Um, we didn't have any, like as a company, we didn't have any experience of them. Um, and it takes a chunk out of your day um, and a chunk out of your job. But that wasn't necessarily expected, first of all. Um, so it's something that we had to kind of start planning in and into the projects that we were undertaking. Um, but at the same time, it so it was very difficult. It was challenging to juggle different responsibilities in my job. Um, but at the same time, I really enjoyed the encouragement to learn. That's what an apprenticeship is there for. Um, I think you can get a job um, and stop learning because you've got the job, you're where you want to be and, and you can just kind of sit back and take it easy. And in an apprenticeship, I obviously you can't. 
you're encouraged to learn and I think that's really important in software testing as well I, I think um, the first speaker mentioned it as well that software testing and software is always changing so you kind of build up this habit of learning because you need to spend the time to get your 20 percent off the job training and you yeah you just build up this uh really great habit of and passion to learn i think that's great no it is a great habit and how helpful did you find the off the job training compared to the on the job um so i to this day i i, I struggle to understand the difference to be honest it, it got very <laughs> blurry um and and some goalposts kept changing or that's how it seemed but um the training provider that i was with um they did residential off the job courses um which i really enjoyed and, and found really useful um on um in my day-to-day -day work i i'd been in software testing for well i was hired as an apprentice um in software testing um but there was a delay between um, me starting my job and my apprenticeship starting so by that point i was already well integrated and had to be working on projects and doing software testing um so my on the job training became more challenging because i wasn't learning from scratch and we didn't have kind of set training programs in place i know some workplaces do um so but at the same time there's i feel like there's always something to learn and there's new directions to take so i spent a lot of my on the job learning doing test automation with our automation engineer um or would try to pick up learning things about performance testing and security testing to help out on the teams that i was working in so there was a good balance um but i i really appreciate the off the job learning style as well great so kieran what's your experience been like being an apprentice positives and negatives <laughs> very you know similar <laughs> Yeah, so uh, very similar kind of circumstance for me. Um, as soon as you start on the apprenticeship program, you really are hitting the ground running. There's so many things coming at you and you just kind of take it in your stride. And, um, you know, as you go from different clients and, and, and different software products, you're learning so much. Um, I mean, technically, you're learning about different tools. Um, you're learning about the different software development lifecycle for each project. Uh, which as you move from client to client, you realize all oh, things are managed differently. You're going to get different software drops coming in at different times. Um, and then you have to adapt as you, as you learn these new things. So I think that's just the great thing about apprenticeships is that because you have the context of all these different clients, you kind of learn based on actual practical knowledge rather than just the theory behind it, because as you learn, um, things are never quite that simple and as clients changed and uh, goalposts move then you realize that you have to kind of change your strategy and and what tools you're using um, in terms of off the job training uh, same for me it, it very much became blurred you know whether it's on the job or off the job it was more the case of as different releases were delivered by the developers you you just naturally have downtime as a tester because you're waiting for developers to fix things or they're looking at requirements again and during that period of downtime that's when you can upskill on different automation tools or even just learning more about the actual product that you're testing yourself i think that in itself just just learning your way around and, and who manages what and who to speak to that's also a soft skill that's quite important in software testing um but it really does the apprenticeship and working on the job kind of fuse together and become one thing almost great and um Yvette, so after listening to everything you've heard today uh, about the content about learning styles experiences and apprentices would you theoretically if you were hiring in the future either in your current job or another consider hiring a, an apprentice and uh, what are your thoughts on the content of the apprenticeship okay um I, I think it's really refreshing actually to 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 see that people have got practical experience of 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 testing 
um, I think if you, you go through a standard route of university, etc., I, I don't know how you get into, into testing. Um, and for me, we look at we we don't we don't differentiate between um, developers and testers that much these days. We we see we see our uh, uh, testers as being test engineers. You are a, a specialist kind of engineer. Um, it's become very much about being highly highly automated. So I I think it's it's really interesting to hear people's experiences. Um, and as an employer, when you look at people, um, I think it was Alison who who said it. She said she mentioned transferable skills. You know, you look at what someone can do to help solve your problem. So yeah, I'd be I'd be open minded in the future, irrespective of someone's background, to 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 look at the you look at the individual and say, well, what is it that they can offer and help solve solve for you? Um, with, with regard to the the actual program, um, again, I think it, the things that Alison said around the people who've gone into software development versus software testing. For me, I look at it all as part of an engineering discipline with specialisms, um, and it was really refreshing. It was really good to see the changes that are coming up in the program as well. Um, you know, I've seen the move to things like agile. It's a big push to, to, to cloud. These are all huge technical problems to test. Um, so I think that's a really, really good step forward. Um, does, that, does that cover it, Adam? It does. I, I want to ask Kieran and Marissa what they think of the, the changes, particularly in terms of the content. Um, do you think those are positive changes to the apprenticeship track? Um, I think so. Um, one of the things that I found the hardest was how to fit the competencies into my day to day. Um, so I work in quite an agile team. Um, I'm a sole tester in a in a squad um, with other developers and um, both myself and the other tester in the team as well. We um, were both doing apprentices they have a few more years experience testing than me um, but it became very hard to try to work out how to fit and mold the technical competencies into an agile context and where we didn't necessarily do all of the activities that they expected so one thing was like a performance testing isn't something I usually do um, isn't something that we as a team usually do um, but it sounds like they're bringing in a bit more flexibility and perhaps a bit more guidance as to how to fit those in um, and, and fit various things into your um, into your apprenticeship I, I think it mentioned something about um, the importance of, of shadowing other teams and things like that it wasn't something mm. that I did um, but I, I wish I had done um, so I think stressing that importance sounds really good. And Kieran, what, what do you think? Yeah, I think the changes are definitely improved over what they used to be, where it was just a case of you can just learn it in a college environment. Well, that's that's not really the goal of the apprenticeship. Um, whilst now, the fact that it all has to be on the job, it's directly evidencing that this candidate is working with skills that are going to work in the actual work environment rather than just a surface level understanding of things it's they can prove that they can deliver to various clients um but then also yeah the the point of having you know shadowing someone or performance testing the the bullet points some of them aren't necessarily easy to cover there's one that's definitely been a thorn in my side and that's been the security testing how to evidence that because that's quite a difficult one to go through because of the whole thing with security testing the point is it needs to be external to the other testing team because of the whole biases with, with it um, but mostly the bullet points that are there currently are definitely ones that if you can evidence them it's you know 
you're no different to people working in software testing for you know years after you if you can cover those then you can kind of work your way up to what they might know so a question so we can take questions from the audience by the way using the the questions functionality but um given that so currently the apprenticeship covers ISTQB kind of testing concepts and it covers general software development tools and their relevance in the, the testing process. Um, I'm interested in, I know we had a, a slide on the screen briefly that we just talked about that talked about some changes, but putting that aside, are there any other areas of testing that you'd like to see added to the apprenticeship track? Um, one of them for me um, I, is exploratory testing and, and more more flexible uh, testing. It's um, very much focused on test scripts and test suite test cases, um, and it's a very rigid structure of how they of, of how it comes across that they want you to show your testing. Um, but I think there's so many more techniques out there. Um, and there's so many ways that people do testing and, and design test ideas and to have a focus on that and, and some education on that as well. Um, I, I think it's a, one of the biggest bugbears for me, I think, is it's missing flexibility as a whole um, mm. to kind of involve those different different areas of, of software testing because it's huge. I think I think Adam, if I, I may as well. So one of the main things that we really struggle with being a consultant is actually um, allowing our apprentices the the roles and the opportunities to actually showcase each one of those criteria. Um, so whereas you may be in a situation where you're going to be doing six months of uh, test automation um, within the time frame of the apprenticeship program. We, we sometimes aren't able to provide every single role uh, in order to essentially uh, get their apprentices to the required, to meet all of those requirements. And, and it's sometimes a little bit difficult as well on the real environment. Um, it's something that we've seen with, with our clients as well, is that um, as soon as apprentices land on a particular client, they because they are they've absolutely been, been absolutely great, they really want to hold on to our apprentices for as long as possible. So that ability to rotate them around is also very limited, which is uh, to the to the value of the client, but then sometimes it's to the detriment of the apprentice as well. So um, it's, it's always a push and pull from uh, us as a recruiter and us as wanting to give our apprentices the best opportunity to learn from all of these different environments to the client wanting to keep hold of uh, an exceptional test automation apprentice that's really showing their value within a client. And that's exactly what we've seen, uh, for example, with Kieran. He's he's a valued member of a team and, and trying to get him out of a client is, is practically impossible at times uh, just because he's so great. Alison, did you want to jump in around methods? Yes, I will, sorry. Um, there is much as you you know sort of you may have been restricted marissa on, on your apprenticeship and i kind of just say in the nice possible way i've just looked at your outcome and it was superb um because obviously i have access as i said to all the epa so i've just had a quick look and it was absolutely excellent what you submitted thank you um there is no restriction on it but sometimes it is very very difficult for an apprentice to actually explain what they've done so they are put down a more formal route um, as in, well, if you do this test, if you create the test script here, then you can put that in your portfolio because everyone can see what you've done and what the outcomes are. What we do and we sort of offer to every single apprentice on the programme is when they get to endpoint assessment, if you have tried something new or done something a bit innovative, talk about it. I'm hoping, Marissa, you were given the opportunity to add anything else, not that you needed to, but, you know, add anything else at interview. And that's the approach we take. Just because the standard has to have a key set of criteria that we are consistently assessing against, we still give the apprentices the opportunity to give their industry experience and, and competencies in different ways. Well, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say, I, I think a lot of uh, my the, the rigidity for me also came from my provider specifically. Um, I, I think their their potential, like their marking of it was very much based on this is what it says that they expect. And yes, I did have the opportunity to, I had a really great conversation with the person Thank interviewing goodness. me 
Um, I had a I had a really great opportunity to talk about testing, um, and that was one of the most enjoyable parts of the apprenticeship for me, actually. Can um, I have that in writing, please? Yes, yes, you can. <laughs> um, but um, I I think it it was the initial the projects that you do within work, um, and the the marking between the provider. So before it goes to BCS and getting to that point, um, I. I don't know what what guidance providers have on marking. I I don't know how the process works, um, but it, it felt like there was a definite tick box exercise, and it was hard to, um, it was hard to kind of navigate around that if you don't work in such a rigid structure in your uh, in your company. Yeah, I mean I do agree, and it's something that you know we don't have control over, but it's something that personally I'm hopefully being more proactive about providing the guidance you know as long as you know you meet core requirements of the apprenticeship standard the evidence can be presented in a variety of different ways and formats so Kieran coming through you're lining yourself up for a distinction obviously um, but you know I am always here to support any apprentice training provider or employer if they need support on a program Great. So thank you, Alison. I think um, my last question, unless any of the panellists have got any other points or if uh, unless there's any audience questions, my last question is um, to most of you is what would you say to someone thinking about starting uh, a testing apprenticeship? Does someone else want to go first so I don't? <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I will go ahead um yeah i think i think it's a great opportunity and i've um myself i took a slightly different route so i went through a graduate scheme on on another large consultancy and and having us having a look at exactly what we provide for the apprentices now and the caliber of the apprentices coming through i think is something i would strongly consider if i if i go back um 12 13 years ago uh, back to when I made the decision to go through university and that route. But I think it's real testament to the quality of the apprentices that we see and, and the opportunities that we see um, for those apprentices that actually you don't need to go to university. Uh, well, although you may want to do that route, I think apprenticeship uh, program really provides you with a completely different route, but actually gets you to the same outcome a lot quicker and in a lot more um, sort of structured and appropriate way. So I think it's a great opportunity for those uh, individuals that um, perhaps would would do better in this environment. And I can see the real value add. And uh, I would strongly consider if I go back in time, I think that I would, I would probably strongly consider doing it myself. If I'm being mm -hmm. completely honest. Kieran, what about you? For sure, yeah. If I could tell myself three years ago, um, after I finished my A-levels, you know, oh, there's this, uh, you can do an apprenticeship, software testing, uh, or I can do my degree in maths. When I think about the value I've gained in a year of software testing compared to the three years of my maths degree, like the difference is just huge. And in the year, I've learned so much that's directly applicable to what I do now. And it's just every day is so rewarding compared to a degree. It was just kind of, you know, every day was just another slog to revise for a test that I will never actually use in the future, at least in my field with maths. Um, with my apprenticeship, when I learn a new tool or, you know, learn about a new system that I'm working on, I know the next day that's directly benefited me. And just simple things like being able to, to demo while on client it's just so rewarding compared to my experience at university so for sure but i i think i'd be biased in that respect to definitely recommend an apprenticeship over anything else great well i'll be this is being recorded and i'm going to send this to the institute of apprenticeships so they have some feedback while they're thinking about uh, what to include in the, the revised standard um but just to wrap up i think i'd just like to thank everyone Day for participating. Um, this is a really underused apprenticeship route. As Alison was saying, you know, 100 testing apprentices versus six or 700 software development apprentices. And I, I can only imagine that's due to employer demand, having seen that there are apprentices available and there are, there are high quality apprentices available. 
Um, so I think you know, in SIGIST we'll be we'll be launching the Apprentice Award, which I presented at the start, and text will go up on that on uh, our website in the coming days. And BCS is committed to continuing to promote apprenticeships, not only the team that that Alison works in in terms of delivering apprenticeships, uh, but in terms of bringing younger people into the the BCS. Uh, volunteer society and, and helping to um, modernize a little bit our own workings as well so there are special groups for young career um, I think it's called the young careers executive uh, we're also looking for a younger person to be on the testing committee panel as well to help diversify ourselves a bit so we'll continue to promote the apprenticeship track and uh, yeah thank you all for coming tonight thanks everyone thank you cheers all Bye, everyone Bye. Hey. Many thanks. Bye, everybody.